Thank you. Thank you, Alex and Ivan, for organizing this. Really have enjoyed the talk so far um, and just grateful to be a part of this community. Um, so my plan is to tell you a little bit about um, what our lab's recently done um, in the aging, uh, working memory, and transcranial alternate and current stimulation space. Um, so to start with, as we age, we hopefully get wiser. And uh, we know that there's a number of various uh, faculties, uh, processes that remain relatively stable and preserved across the adult lifespan, according to longitudinal and uh, cross-sectional studies, processes such as autobiographical memory, emotional processing, automatic memory processes, theory of mind performance, verbal knowledge. Um, on the other hand, uh, we're also aware for decades that there's a number of uh, kind of properties of the mind and processes that show a rather sharp linear decline with advancing age, such as overall information processing speed, working memory, episodic memory encoding. Um, our lab is uh, particularly interested in um, cognitive processes like working memory. Um, and here again, you can just see a, a variety of types of working memory, show this robust linear decline across the adult lifespan. Um, so working memory is this really fundamental uh, component of cognitive information processing architecture. Uh, it's an ability that allows us to store behaviorally relevant information in mind over a period of uh, seconds. Uh, it's a limited storage capacity and also allows us to manipulate information online, um, which is why, for example, historically psychologists have referred to it as a kind of mental sketch pad or workbench. Um, so it's where we kind of do work, uh, problem solve, reason, make decisions, comprehend language, uh, do math problems, and so on. So it's kind of really fundamental role in human cognition. Uh, it's a major interest of, of ours. Um, we uh, still don't know um, in any kind of precise computational terms how the brain represents information and carries it forward in time. Um, kind of fundamental, enduring problem of uh, neuroscience, um, but there's a variety of theories across different spatial scales, and I want to focus on kind of circuit or network level scale. Um, so it's been proposed that synchronization or fast neuronal correlations um, between different uh, rhythms, uh, different frequencies of different rhythms, um, may serve as a mechanism of online working memory storage and processing. And in particular, theta gamma phase amplitude coupling is kind of this uh, extensively studied neural coding scheme of uh, phase amplitude of, of this kind of of this sort um, that's been uh, observed during working memory maintenance in animals and humans. Um, and so this is where a fat, the amplitude of a fast or gamma wave is correlated or coupled to a phase interval of a slower uh, wave like theta. Um, and uh, PAC has been observed particularly in temporal cortex uh, here in these pre-surgical epileptic patients intracranially and uh, cortical temporal um, temporal cortex. You can see as you load objects into working memory, um, you see a parametric manipulation of theta gamma phase amplitude coupling. Uh, again, uh, hypothesized to be a neural correlate of working memory storage um, and processing. In addition to temporal cortex, um, the prefrontal cortex has been implicated in working memory and uh, but rather than active content processing and storage, it's been hypothesized to be involved in, in coordinating um, and top-down control and monitoring of contents in sensory areas involved in representing um, objects. Um, and so how does uh, prefrontal regions uh, coordinate, interact with sensory cortices is potentially through uh, another kind of well-studied neural coding scheme, a mechanism of phase synchronization. Um, and this is where um, two or more neural signals are oscillating with a consistent relative phase angles. Um, and this has been observed um, also in, in humans, um, particularly in the high gamma, low alpha range of uh, phase synchronization between prefrontal and temporal regions during working memory maintenance, uh, such as in this, this human MEG study. So th these are the two um, coding motifs or, or synchronization uh, measures that we're interested in, in particular in um, getting some grips on uh, why older people show these age-related working memory deficits. So um, 
we're asking the question, do age really working memory deficits result from impairments in these rhythmic mechanisms indexed by phase amplitude coupling and phase synchronization? Um, and so our predictions are simply that um, these mechanisms um, that are indexed uh, by these measures are intact in, in younger people and attenuated or just disrupted in some fashion in, in older adults, accounting for their working memory deficits. So we have um, 40, 20, and 30 year olds come into the lab, and 40, 60, and 70 year olds come into the lab and do this really canonical delayed match to sample task um, where they view a complex real world object. We take it away, they maintain it in their mind's eye for three seconds. We show them a probe stimulus, which is either a match or does not match the original object, which they indicate with a button press on a game controller. Um, and then we uh, also have control trials, which is like kind of a slick approach we're borrowing from other researchers um, in the working memory field where um, the trial is identical to the memory trial, except the task, instead of maintaining an object in memory, is to uh, perform a task at the probe stimulus, which is just to indicate with a button press whether this um, grading is tilted left or right from the vertical and is followed by a mask. So this is kind of a, a clever way um, previous people, uh, researchers have shown where you can isolate the maintenance activity and a working memory task uh, independent of stimulus or non-memory related um, neural activity. It's also a kind of vigilance um, uh, control comparison. So when we do this, we can see behaviorally that we're able to uh, replicate uh, these deficits in older individuals, um, basically consistent with about three decades of research. People are slower and less accurate at performing this task, these 60 and 70 year olds relative to the younger 20 and 30 year olds. Uh, while subjects are performing the task, we're recording the electroencephalogram and offline computing um, a memory specific phase amplitude coupling. Um, during the delay period between memory and control blocks of trials for a combination of phase frequencies and amplitude frequencies. Um, and then we're using cluster-based permutation statistics to isolate the memory-specific spatial spectral clusters for each age group. And when we do that, we find significant clusters of theta gamma pack in the 7 to 8 hertz phase and 26 or 34 hertz amplitude frequencies at left temporal electrodes. Again, during the delay period, comparing memory to control trials. Um, inverse source modeling estimates this effect uh, recorded at the scalp electrodes to uh, left temporal cortical regions. Um, we don't make strong claims about inverse source modeling, but it's potential kind of hypothesis for uh, non-human primate research and microstimulation. Um, or imaging researchers and so on. It gives us kind of a, a rough estimate for where these effects may be generated neuroanatomically. Older individuals, uh, importantly, uh, no clusters were identified. Um, and a group by block interaction in this pack space finds uh, that 8 hertz phase and 30 hertz amplitude center frequencies are where this pack effect uh, lived. Um, we can seed the um, theta band identified by this pack analysis in source space um, in the left temporal region and calculate uh, phase locking value, our, our measure, uh, most common measure of phase synchronization. Um, and when we do that, we see a significant cluster of phase locking values in this kind of roughly prefrontal region, um, which indicates that there's a stream of connectivity uh, from between prefrontal and left temporal regions during the delay period, uh, but only in healthy individuals. Uh, no clusters were identified in our, in our 60 and 70 year old individuals. Um, we can do the same with the gamma band um, based on the, the PAC analysis. And we see this, this short range um, stream of gamma connectivity um, between the, the temporal occipital regions, which um, was not affected by age makes a nice uh, dissociation with the, the theta band. When we look at uh, pack behavior relationships, um, like we do, we essentially find that um, a significant relationship for younger people and a non-significant relationship with older people, so subject-wise um, correlation, each data point here is a subject. And so the tighter the theta gamma phase amplitude coupling, the, the Im improved uh, working memory success on this task. 
uh, which is true for younger people, but not true for older people. Um, so this kind of, we were delighted and we, we take this kind of correlational cognitive neuroscience approach um, in the lab of uh, you know, comparing neural and behavioral measures based on manipulations of task demands. Um, but we think to even strengthen the approach is to use tools um, that can afford uh, causal tests of, of neural activity. And so for that, I've actually eliminated my introductory slides on um, non-invasive brain stimulation and TACS, given the nature of this conference. And I'll just go right into the protocol we've been developing. Um, this is a TACS protocol. Um, in the top left, you can see the number of electrodes, their location and intensity per electrode, um, which we devised based on uh, current flow modeling. We're targeting the left prefrontal and left temporal regions. Um, we're using uh, the so-called HD TACS high definition, which just uses these right these smaller 11, 12 millimeter diameter ring electrodes configured in this kind of flanking manner um, to increase the focality of current flow, um, which is a, a significant improvement relative to large sponge pads of the traditional type that just takes out swaths of cortex, as you can see from this paper from 13. Um, we're also using TACS. Um, um, so these sinusoidal currents, and just to, to shout out to, to Matt's elegant work, um, you can see the TACS has been shown to modulate and train spike phase um, independent of, of spike rate. There's even a newer study that shows this kind of nice dose dependent manner in which you can entrain spike phase with TACS in non-human primates um, based on the stimulation intensity. Um, and then also important to point out um, that the protocol we've developed is frequency personalized. Uh, it's frequency matched um, in, a, in a functional manner. So we, we have all of our, our subjects come in for a pre-experiment session, uh, perform an abbreviated version of our delayed match to sample working memory task, um, record EEG, uh, compute the, the phase locking value uh, in the source level between frontal and left temporal regions, uh, find each individual's peak, peak frequency, and then use that frequency with the half a hertz resolution to, uh, programmed into our TCS machine. Um, so that if your um, frontal temporal uh, theta phase synchronization is 6.2 hertz, so we just round down, you'll get six hertz stimulation. If it's 8.4, you'll get 8.5 hertz stimulation. Uh, that's within the theta band. Um, another feature of this protocol is uh, the, the phase content. It's the so-called kind of synchronizing montage or in-phase montage. So it's a zero degrees phase offset um, of the alternating current that's applied simultaneously to the frontal and left temporal regions. And shown um, uh, a few years ago that you can actually obtain bidirectional causal control over measures of EEG phase synchronization based on the phase angle of the alternating current that you're applying to the brain. Um, and the intensity was based on current flow modeling. We used uh, 1.6 milliamps within the, the safety limits of TACS in humans. Um, the design is a double blind. Uh, individuals, the subjects are blind. Uh, the experimenter is blind. It's sham control is within subjects. So each subject serves as their own control. Stimulation is applied for 25 minutes. Uh, in the sham condition, it just ramps up and down at the beginning and the end of the uh, session to simulate the ticking, tickling, itching, poking sensations that people endorse on active days. And we focus analysis uh, post-stimulation on the 50 minute period where people are continuing to perform the task and EEG is being recorded. Um, the uh, order of stimulation was uh, counterbalanced across subjects and happy to talk more about the blinding information um, and the results uh, of that. So what I previously showed you was from the sham baseline condition in the older adults. Um, and we actually had uh, that younger uh, cohort of individuals also receive sham stimulation to avoid demand characteristics. So they're wearing the entire apparatus, um, but receiving sham stimulation. Um, after 25 minutes of this type of personalized TACS, our delight and surprise, um, although we were kind of more surprised in 2018 when this first, it's been some years, but uh, the active condition uh, revived uh, theta gamma phase amplitude coupling in older individuals. So now these clusters are found 
um, to be significant. Um, and we're also seeing kind of stimulation by block interaction, this degree of frequency specificity in, in pack space, uh, again, at this, uh, these center frequencies of eight, eight hertz phase, 30 hertz amplitude. Um, seeding the left temporal regions in the theta band identified by PAC. Um, here are the sham conditions I showed previously from younger and older people and in older individuals. We can also resurrect this, this kind of long distance stream of theta phase connectivity between prefrontal and left temporal regions. Um, and interestingly, the, that short range gamma um, um, effect uh, was not affected uh, neither by age or by stimulation, which again uh, says something about the frequency specificity of the protocol. Behaviorally, we found effects to preferentially uh, improve working memory accuracy on this task, um, but independent of reaction time. So it didn't appear to be a simple speed accuracy trade-off. We can make people better without slowing them down uh, is what I is how I typically uh, explain this. And also the PAC behavior relationships uh, were now significant for older people. So not only can we improve, uh, kind of draw out this, this theta gamma PAC signature in the brains of older people after 25 minutes of stimulation and this longer stream of, of theta phase connectivity, but we can also imbue that Pack effect with uh, functional significance, with behavioral significance. Now, the correlation showing is that the the higher the the better the coupling, the better the working memory success on this task. So the first thing we wanted to do was to to replicate these principal findings, um, and so we invited another cohort of twenty eight uh, older individuals in their sixties and seventies, um, but a double blind placebo con uh, sham controlled within subjects. So people come in for five separate test days, the order counterbalanced across subjects. We first wanted to replicate what we found in the first experiment. So we had a sham baseline condition. Um, we have what we call frontal temporal in phase tune. Tune just means the personalized feature of the stimulation and it's in phase. Um, and then we also want to test the frequency and spatial specificity. So we had a frontal temporal in phase non-tuned where we just used a uniform six hertz uh, theta stimulation and also just stimulating the frontal alone or the temporal alone uh, regions. And what we found was we could first replicate the principal behavioral findings of experiment one, um, having a showing uh, improvement in just the accuracy without, without affecting reaction time. Um, but we also didn't find any effects from the non-personalized or the individually uh, spatially targeted frontal or temporal um, stimulation montages. Um, and just to point out kind of uh, the degree of rigor here, typically, as I'm sure you know, non-invasive brain researchers when trying to establish frequency or spatial specificity might typically uh, for in terms of space stimulate another brain region, say motor cortex in this region, but we're actually stimulating uh, one uh, of the two regions that were involved in the original montage. So it's um, quite, quite rigorous in that regard. Um, and the same with the frequency. If we want to establish frequency specificity, we might to be kind of the gold standard, stimulate a neighboring frequency band like alpha or delta, but this is actually within theta band. Uh, it's just not personalized to each individual um, theta band dynamics. We also invited in 18 um, healthy young adults, 20s and, and 30 year olds, um, and applied the same uh, personalized um, HDT, ACS or frontal temporal cortex, but this time using that 180 degree phase offset, the antiphase stimulation. Um, to see if we could get this bidirectional causal control over behavior. This is admittedly a, a, a significantly smaller study with just 18 people within subjects, um, but it is kind of enticing that we found um, slower reaction times and, and impaired working memory performance um, using this uh, antiphase or desynchronizing TACS montage. So just to um, provide some summary here, um, age appears to impair, but HDTACS can rescue theta gamma phase amplitude coupling, theta phase stimulation, and working memory performance accuracy. Um, the stimulation effectiveness uh, really hinged on these spatial and spectral features of the protocol. 
um, being frontal temporal and also being uh, individually personalized in order to see significant effects. Um, and phase was also an important feature. Um, the in phase uh, appears to improve and perhaps anti phase uh, impair working memory performance on this task. It's also uh, worth pointing out the results are they're consistent with theories that propose age related cognitive decline result from um, cortical disconnection from changes in functional uh, uh, brain activity. Um, it's also consistent with theories of prefrontal cortex and aging. Prefrontal cortex uh, shows this un unusual vulnerability with age. Um, and our, our work shows that people, you know, they, they struggle to use prefrontal cortex to synchronize and uh, drive subsequent, subsequent coupling um, in sensory regions uh, important for memory performance. Um, and then overall, the results are interesting to us and we have a lot of studies actively uh, following up on this work. Um, and they hint at the you know, ability to non-invasively intervene uh, in temporal coupling between distant uh, rhythmic um, uh, brain activities in the, in the human brain and to optimize and potentially also to impede uh, cross area communication um, necessary for memory processing and behavior. Um, so a final slide, we're um, conducting a meta-analysis in the process of this. Um, we're curious about the viability of TACS to improve cognitive functions. And we have over 60 studies and 120 effect sizes um, across a variety of cognitive domains. And so far, uh, just preliminarily, the, this here's what the data look like. Uh, the domains in which there's the most uh, research being done, um, working memory, long-term memory, attention, executive control, we actually see significant uh, pooled effect sizes. Um, and also interesting and, uh, and consistent with what some of the research Simon was showing, uh, that meta regression shows that the theta rate TACS is a significantly larger effect sizes in studies compared to the, the gamma rate TACS. Um, you know, we're, we're also interested in, in looking at other features. Um, there's very little in the way of personalization in, in the current literature, um, but we think potentially with uh, that TACS could be more effective um, when guided by things like current flow modeling, um, basic neuroscience um, theory, um, individual uh, physiological dynamics, um, and newer technologies like HDTACS that afford better spatial and functional targeting. So with that, I uh, want to thank my lab, our, our, our funding sources, sponsors, uh, John Nguyen, uh, especially for this work on aging, uh, who helped with data collection and analysis and writing, and Trey Grover and Renata Vizalina, who um, are involved in the, the meta regression study. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Robert. Um, and we have a lot of questions. So let's begin. Uh, first one, do you have any suggestion for optimizing stimulation dose, including electric location and intensity for each individual based on EEG signals? Uh, information about optimizing dose? Yeah, yeah. So uh, stimulation location, stimulation dose based on EEG signal. Do you, well, what's yeah, yeah, I mean, that's, that's uh, what we're trying, it's a great question. That's what we're trying to, to nail uh, and narrow in on with using EG synchronization. I mean, we're trying to take, we're taking this perspective that, um, uh, you know, it's, an, it's important to study uh, brain networks and how they synchronize through electrophysiological oscillations. And if we can hone in on certain properties of how they oscillate and synchronize, we might be able to use those to, to guide uh, more effective TACS protocols we're interested in closed loop applications, which we're busy uh, constructing now in the lab. But right now, you know, we're um, been putting a lot of energy into uh, frequency uh, uh, personalization. Um, there's a variety of other uh, right features that we can use to personalize montages, but um, that one and uh, obviously space and anatomical targeting is important based on current flow modeling and ideally, which we haven't done this yet, yet but to get, um, but other groups have um, with, with some success, uh, individual subject MRI um, and to 
integrate that with our current flow modeling to improve spatial targeting. Um, so between the spatial targeting modeling and using EEG or MEG to um, frequency of, of synchronization measures to guide stimulation, we're, we're optimistic and, and having some success. Um, so we think those might be important for, for guiding, um, for dosing. Thank you. Um, there is also a question about frequency specificity while you touch on this topic. Uh, so in your study in young and older adults, uh, what was the range of individual theta frequencies you observed? Uh, whether subject with high and low theta peaks, for instance? Right, yeah, good question. Um, we reported that in our latest paper. I, f I forget if that's that's in that that aging paper. Um, the range the, the range used is in the paper. It's it's a broad. I want to say maybe three to nine. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's three to nine hertz. Uh, don't quote me. I have to double check, but I I think that's three to nine hertz. And um, I think we reported the. The standard error, uh, the standard deviation as well, but we just looked within a broad uh, theta band um, when looking for those phase locking values. Mm 